Thank you. It's our privilege to be here and present where we are with our findings in terms of our study. Um, first, we want to thank the opportunity to really force us to have a truly interdisciplinary team, uh, nurse, health administrator, economist, and sociologist. We learned a lot from each other. We learned a lot about the questions that we make assumptions about the answers to because we don't ask in a way that's the language that somebody else would use in another discipline. Um, it was also a huge leap for those of us that were um, trained more as quantitative researchers to do qualitative research, and our sociologists kept forcing us back to the methodology to be true to the process because we did believe that the methodology would help us to answer one of the questions we were trying to get at. We're going to talk about setting the stage and where we started from in terms of what was the importance of this whole issue of was the work environment different on nights and weekends and the, the literature base on off-peak mortality and the, sort of the general importance of the issues. We'll talk about our study and the findings that we have to date and then what we believe is the impact of our work and where we're going to go from here. There is a lot of research on the impact of off-peak mortality. Um, Thirty years ago, we knew that there was a difference in the care quality that was provided on nights and weekends that there was provided during the day. Unfortunately, we don't know much about what actually occurs that is different in that um, sort of what we call the black box of the off-peak effect. And even today, we're still putting out studies that say the same thing about the fact that you are one, if more likely to be admitted to the hospital on nights and weekends, and two, more likely to have a higher mortality rate, a larger length of stay, complications, a delay in procedures and treatments because you are admitted on nights and weekends. That's great. So what has changed in the last 30 years is sort of the question we sort of kept in the back of our minds um, as we began to look at this question. We did do a rather extensive literature review. Um, we have an annotated bibliography that we published in a, um, conjunction with our study. And there are over 100 studies done, um, increased off-peak mortality, looking at various diagnostic groups. And basically, the conclusion is the same. You don't want to be admitted to the hospital on nights and weekends. You don't want to be transferred from one unit to another on nights and weekends. You don't want to have a cardiac arrest on the night or weekend um, environment. And it is not unique to the United States. This is a global issue. This is also found in the literature if you look at findings from other countries. So we are not alone in looking at this challenge. What we are um, perhaps alone is the fact that we were interested in trying to understand more about what is the nurse's role on nights and weekends that may be impacting this off-peak mortality effect. We also looked at issues around what is the difference in terms of the hospital size, the volumes, the hospital, uh, hospital volumes, the physician volumes, and the nursing staffing levels. And I think the greatest amount of work has been done on looking at nurse staffing. There have been a lot of efforts to standardize nurse staffing because there is clearly a relationship between nurse staffing and outcomes. But what we're going to talk about is one of the interesting findings that we have is, um, unfortunately, that often falls on the backs of nights and weekend staff as we try to get to standardized ratios that are recommended and competency and skill set ratios that are recommended. We have some challenges in terms of how we actually staff our off-peak shifts from nights and weekends from the perception of the nurses that are actually working those shifts. Furthermore, many states have moved forward in terms of regulating these things and not only putting in either regulations for standardized ratios, but also for the, the role of nurses in developing staffing plans and the reduction of mandatory overtime. So there is clearly a movement in changes in nurse staffing, but we still didn't feel like this actually addressed the issues for what was actually going on in terms of nursing in the night and weekend that was different than what was occurring during the day. And if you think about it, 64% of nursing occurs off-peak, outside of those hours when the hospital administrators, the physicians, the ancillary services, the other departments are not functioning at all or are not fully staffed. Rare will you find a hospital administrator wandering the halls at 2 a.m. Rare will you find even a nurse manager on staff in the overnight hours. So that is one of the things that you have that causes a concern and there are a lot of opportunities in terms of things that go wrong during the night. The patient is also supposed to be different on nights and weekends. We expect the patient to be resting. Unfortunately, they don't always get the memo. 
The other thing that's changed in the last 30 years when we begin to look at the difference in mortality rates in peak and off-peak is the consumer's awareness of the fact that, that something is different that does occur on nights and weekends. When we first presented it initially two years ago, uh, Susan Denser said we should uh, call our study Saturday Night Fever, don't get one. The consumer knows that they are at higher risk if they are admitted on the nights or weekends. And I'm turning this over to Patty, who's going to talk about our actual findings. Thanks. Our sociologist isn't here to represent the method, so I'm going to do my, my best to do that for her. Um, institutional ethnography is not a typical kind of ethnography that you might be familiar with. It focuses on identification of culture. We're interested in, first of all, first and foremost, the social organization of knowledge. Who knows what and why do they know what they know from their point of view? We know also that institutional knowledge um, determines how organizations function, and we have a basic assumption in our study that organizations and hospitals, in this case, deliver what they are organized to deliver. So there's a certain amount of information going into the organization, and the organization has got the output that we're concerned about, which is higher mortality. We also are assuming and also finding evidence that this organization and this knowledge determines from a distance what happens locally. In other words, what we think we know about the hospital, how it's organized to operate, all come into play at the bedside with the direct care nurse taking care of a patient. So things, uh, knowledge and people who are not even there at the bedside are still influencing what the nurse is doing. Now that's pretty difficult perhaps to, to to cap encapsulate, so I'm going to give you an analog real quickly, an example that maybe you can relate to um, personally the way that I did. I went to a fast food restaurant that was sort of upscale, I won't name it, uh, but it was for breakfast, and I went in and I asked for two scrambled egg whites and a croissant, and they said, I'm sorry, we can't do that. I said, okay, well, let me look at your menu, and they had scrambled eggs on the menu. So I said, great, let me have two scrambled eggs and a croissant. At the point of sale, there was a calculator, or I'm sorry, a computerized cash register that, that had a button on it marked scrambled eggs. And automatically that information was transmitted to the kitchen. There was also um, inventory control, food cost analysis, um, the time of day that that order took place. All that information was being captured by this computerized point of sale um, cash register. They gave me, I gave them my money, they gave me my little card that had my number on it. I went to sit down, and in just a moment, I was served two orders of scrambled eggs. <laughs> so being the institutional ethnographer that I am, I, I asked the young man who brought them, I said, could, could I just you know, get a little information about scrambled eggs here and, and what that means? And what he told me was that each order of scrambled eggs is made up with two ladles full of egg mixture. It's already mixed up to make it more efficient and to have that food quality and cost control that they needed. And I said, well, then tell me uh, how many eggs are there per ladle? There were two. I had gone in asking for two egg whites and a croissant, and I got eight eggs. <laughs> And I want to use that as an as a analog as we go through some of the things that we found to kind of get you into what an institutional ethnographer is interested in. We're not so much saying that these folks made an error. We're saying they followed their procedure correctly. It's just not stacking up with what the consumer ordered. So, Using that as our background, let's talk about what institutional ethnography really focuses on. The first thing it focuses on is how an institution works up information. What they think is important, how they measure it, and how they aggregate it. That becomes very critical to institutional ethnographers. We're also interested in how rules created elsewhere 
come into play at the point of sale, in my case, where a, a very well thought out um, franchise agreement and training had created the situation that occurred when I went in to order scrambled eggs. Those people weren't even there anymore, but that ruling relation was at work in how they took my order. We're also interested in whose standpoint we're taking, because if you looked at the manager who was not there at that early hour in the morning when I was making my order, that manager would not be able to look at the information that was captured by their system and tell that the consumer did not get what the consumer thought uh, they were going to get. But the consumer could certainly have told them. We're interested in the unintended consequences of policies and procedures and uh, ways of doing work. We're assuming that, for the most part, those things work pretty well. So we're not doing uh, extensive work into what does work. We're wanting to find out where does what usually work, where does that break down, particularly on off-peak shifts? How do people do the workarounds that they have to do to actually make something work in those kinds of situations? You're probably thinking to yourself, well, why, don't they think, why didn't I think that that was a mistake when they brought me eight eggs? I mean, that sounds pretty ridiculous. But there was work that needed to be done at that point of sale that didn't get done. Somebody just pushed a button and didn't do that extra workaround to really ask me, you want eight eggs? So there was work that was hidden, and we believe, and we certainly got the evidence to show it, that nurses are doing a tremendous amount of invisible work. We call it workaround uh, when it becomes visible, but what they're having to do is take systems and rules and ways of gathering information and work it around so their patients get what they want and need. And nurses told us again and again how much the, the uh, effort was being put into their work to, to get within the system to make the system provide what the patient needed. Now, of course, there was also work that I, as a consumer, didn't do. Because I should have known right away when they said they didn't have egg whites that there was something wrong about the way they were thinking about eggs, if that, <laughs> because I would have expected they could have rustled up to egg whites. So there was some work that the consumer must also do, and I think we haven't even uh, scratched the surface on what that might be. Uh, to deal with this off-peak problem. And then I think, again, we go back to that most important thing that a sociologist would remind us is the social construction of information. And so how information uh, really determines the roles and consequences is incredibly important.